Yeah, uh, maybe. Work. I almost want to run again. Here we go. Yeah, maybe it doesn't work with the clicker. Oh, no, no. Okay. So, yeah, uh, take it away. Luke. Okay. Uh, let's make it quick. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Luke. I'm a student at the TU Berlin, where I'm a second, sester, uh, second semester student. Um, I'm studying computer science. I also work at Lotse, where I'm a software engineer. Um, now that we have a lot of containers, we want we somehow hmm? we somehow want to ship them. We want to. Okay. Huh? Huh? Yeah, okay. We <laughs> 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 um, we want to ship them. We want to get them on our infrastructure, and for this uh, we need a scheduler. So this is where Kubernetes comes into place. Um, it's an open source container orchestration tool. Um, the word Kubernetes means helmsman or pilot, so it does care about uh, scheduling. It decides where your container should run depending on your workload. It cares about life cycle and health management, so it keeps your containers running despite failures. It's also doing scaling, so it makes sets of containers bigger or smaller. Um, also, it's doing naming and discovery, uh, so that you can find out where your containers are running and your applications can find out where your containers are running. For all of those features, it provides you an easy to use API on top of your infrastructure. So you don't need to have so you don't have to care about your hardware level anymore. Yeah. So it all started at Google. Um, Google internally uses uh, Borg, which is a which is their proprietary container orchestration tool. Um, the learnings and the work heavily influenced the development of Kubernetes. Uh, which was started by a group of Google developers. Uh, later it was donated to the CNCF. And um, with this tool they start over 2 billion containers. So, uh, on all, like Google is starting over 2 billion containers a week uh, for managing the Google Cloud Platform. So they have quite a big workload. Um, so they published a paper about Borg and what they have learned. Um, so there are some um, things I'd like to mention. So um, <coughs> you uh, normal like uh, they try to split uh, batch jobs. So you have your production jobs, which are like website, like their Gmail search, and so on. Those are the things you have to run in production, and then you have your non-production wor uh, workloads which are things like backing up, backing up, start, um, backing up um, data, so they run occasionally. Um, and they run them uh, when they had uh, some resources to share. And then they tried to combine those, and they gained a lot uh, of resources back with uh, running production workloads and batch jobs uh, in the same um, at the same uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, this uh, graph shows us um, uh, the usage over time. So this red line here is the actual usage, and this is our hardware limit. So at the moment we don't buy any servers. So this is byte sale line, um, and this is our reservation. This is made up our scheduler. Um, and this uh, reserves some resources for us. Um, and so this is uh, potentially usable, reusable, and we use this to run our batch jobs, uh, so our non-production workloads. Um, as you can see here, uh, many tasks get evicted um, in the non-production workload. So uh, you can see this mostly it's because of preemption. Because uh, when we have a, a new peak, um, our batch jobs get killed, and then we have to start all over again. So we lose a lot of resources. Um, this uh, is a graph of uh, memory and CPU utilization. So this is very important uh, to us because we want to use as much resources as we can. So we have to try to um, we have to try to use uh, as much CPU uh, as much at <coughs> as much CPUs on a machine as we use memory on a machine, because when we don't have memory, we can't 
use any uh, more re uh, CPU resources and vice versa. So this is a this is a limit. So um, because of this, we um, try to uh, schedule jobs very uh, uh, very smart, so that so that we uh, can use a lot of resources. Um, also, uh, the whole approach is application centric um, and not hardware centric. So we are trying to give developers um, a better experience deploying their application. Uh, as you can see here, it's a pretty easy concept. So we can access our API and then start some jobs and um, we abstract away the whole hardware. So it runs basically on everything. It runs uh, on bare metal, it runs on uh, Raspberry Pis, on the Google Cloud Platform, um, and AWS, and on-premise, bare metal. So when we want to um, manage such, such a big um, system, we have to do it declaratively. So we don't want to provision machines by on. We, want to, we don't want to schedule every container. We don't want to SSH into machines, and we don't want to say how to specifically run everything. Um, so this is a manifest. This is a, dis a description of how we want to have things running. Uh, here, for example, this says that we want to have uh, them uh, three times running. So uh, we, we say we want to have three pods running, which I will come to uh, back uh, in a minute. And then we define this pod. So we give it a template. And we're saying, uh, when you're starting one uh, created after this template, uh, use the specifications. So we want to have a container running with the image Hello World. This is the image. Um, it, it will get built, uh, for example, when you're using Docker from Docker Hub. Uh, you can say how many resources you want. So for example, here we have uh, 100 megabytes and uh, 100 milli of a CPU. And then we can also expose ports. Um, so Kubernetes is uh, built on top of many small concepts that can be leveraged into a framework to build distributed applications. Uh, its most atomic unit is a pod, which is an abstraction around containers. Uh, all containers inside of a pod share the same namespace, so they share um, a local host and uh, a file system. They have um, they, they are not meant to run monoliths, uh, but to reuse uh, containers and functionality. So for example, when you have a logging agent uh, running uh, next to your application, which grabs logs and then push it somewhere, uh, we don't want to build this every time into our container. Because maybe we want to update our logging agent, but we still want to have our application running. So uh, when we have two containers with the same logging agent, we would have to build both uh, images, push them, and everything will get um, restarted, and we don't want to have this. So this is why we encapsulate functionality. Okay. Um, so <laughs> so they, they are ephemeral. Uh, and they are functionally identical, and we don't want them to have any state. So we can have as many pods as we want, and it doesn't matter which pod we talk to, we every time should get the same response back. Um, we store state uh, in the volume. All right, so now we have many pods flying around. We have created a lot of them, and we want for example, users or an internal service to access one of them. Normally, we would have to uh, use a service discovery or we have to build our, our own, but as pods are ephemeral, uh, they um, very often change and maybe when you try to access one, they, uh, uh, the pod is already away. Um, so we have a concept for this. It's called a service. Um, a service basically is a virtual IP that routes traffic to one of the pods we have created. So every time we, we hit the service, which is just an IP in our network, it will get redirected to one of the pods we have created. So basically it aggregates pods 
And we can do this because they are functionally identical. Um, pods somehow need to communicate. Um, and this, uh, this uh, <coughs> um, and as uh, they are referred as small hosts, the, every pod gets its own IP address. So we can reach pods in our network with, across nodes with an uh, IP address, and the traffic gets redirected to the pod we want to uh, to the pod we want to access. This behavior doesn't change. Um, across uh, internal networking uh, plugins, uh, software-defined networks. Um, if we change the hardware or anything, this behavior will still be consistent. Left? OK. Um, so we somehow need to group pods um, or resources in general. And therefore, we have a very uh, easy concept, which can be quite powerful. So we can tag every resource with uh, a key and value pair, or a set of key and value pairs, and then uh, we can match on those. This pretty much is it. So uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, sorry, I, I was not aware that it's, that it's already over. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks uh, for, for, the, for the presentation. Any questions about Kubernetes? Oh, here we go. Wait, I have to take the microphone. OK, go ahead. Can you have uh, a mix of uh, Kubernetes and uh, normal HPC scheduling stuff? Uh, yes, you can run them beside each other. So you can expose, uh, for example, a service. And then you can access this service, which may have an external IP. And then you, you can talk to this service, and the traffic gets uh, into the cluster, and then it reached one of your pods. That's not what I meant. I, uh, I meant uh, we have jobs running, mm -hmm. whatever, um, MD, molecular dynamics, but we have a little bit of resources left. Mm -hmm. Can we submit jobs with Kubernetes in these free resources? Um, I'm familiar with that so we haven't had that. Um, you would, um, if you have this hardware available, you can specifically dedicate it to Kubernetes. Um, but there are some binaries running on the server, uh, which measure um, uti um, hardware utilization. Um, but it, uh, the scheduler, uh, like um, the scheduler, needs to know. Um, from the definition, how many resources are left. So maybe to that point, um, I mean, it depends on wh how you schedule your job, right? If you pin it to, let's say, 90% of the cores and say it's like core zero to core whatever. Dynamic. And but you you can pin it to a core, right? No. Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. So if you pin it to a core and there's one core left, then you can pin a container to this exact core, and then you can make it so that it overlaps. Or you can just decrease the nice value of the container so that it just gets cycles when your computation is not running. So that's um, that's possible. But maybe that's uh, more to the point that uh, the next presenter can uh, can uh, can address this, I guess, right? With next flow, maybe that's a good thing. Other questions? Okay. Thanks, Luke. <laughs>